This sculpture is significant in many ways. For Michelangelo's career, it marks his first large-scale public commission. It basically makes his name. The patron was a French cardinal who was an ambassador to Rome, so a man of great power and importance in the political sphere and the religious sphere. He commissioned the sculpture because he intended it to adorn his burial tomb in St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. You first encountered St. Peter's, that is, old St. Peter's in Rome, in the very beginning of this class. And you may remember that I said you can't see it in photographs because it's no longer standing. Because in this period, a pope will demolish it. So this guy, Pope Julius II, is going to be one of the most important Renaissance art patrons. He will have Michelangelo paint his ceiling. It's called the Sistine Ceiling. And Raphael paint his office, as it were, the Stanza della Signatura. And as if all of that weren't enough to glorify his papacy, he will also build a new St. Peter. This new St. Peter's will be incredibly grand, massive, and classicizing, and it will be worked on by a series of architects, including Michelangelo. But that's all in the future right now. At this point, the French cardinal does not know that St. Peter's will be demolished. He's simply planning for his tomb, and he hires Michelangelo with very interesting terms in the contract. So this was a high profile commission and we actually have the contract to see the terms under which Michelangelo performed this job. The contract gave him one year and said, this is an actual clause, quote, it will be the most beautiful work of marble that exists in Rome today and that no master could do the work better. That was actually language that was used to hold an artist to a standard. The standard here is the most beautiful in the region. And I think that Michelangelo succeeded. Certainly the people of his time did, which is pretty amazing considering this subject matter was very unusual. It was, it was a French and Northern subject matter, very much unheard of in Rome and Italy. As was standard practice, the contract set the theme for Michelangelo. He did not choose the Pieta, in which the Virgin supports and mourns the dead Jesus in her lap. And the, here in the textbook section, Roman High Renaissance Michelangelo, they explain that this was very popular in the north, in northern Europe, where the cardinal was from. It was less popular. It was, in fact, very unusual in Italy. So here we can compare an example of that subject matter, Pieta, also known as Vesperbild in German, um, from 1330 in the Germanic Rhine region, made out of wood, not marble. Very different to work in wood and polychromy means colored paint, multiple paint colors added versus the, the plain white marble, the Carrera marble that Michelangelo used. So one of the things this comparison makes clear is how much Michelangelo has a very high Renaissance quality in his style. There's a sense of classical, classical ideals in the body with its, its defined anatomy. There's a kind of pyramidal form, which we talked about, the stability of the pyramid and the way in which it reaches up towards the heavens. And also here is a quote from the textbook, a characteristic high Renaissance sense of gravity and decorum, a kind of seriousness, a sense of momentousness in the artwork. This certainly has very serious emotions, but there's more of a sense of intensity and expressive agony, extremes, where the emotion here is very powerful, but it's also given in a kind of harmonious 
arrangements so that we have a sense of complex but ordered relationship of individual parts to the whole. So much deep carving of the drapery, so much precision in the carving of the patella, the thighs, the body, and yet a sense that this is all integrated into a very idealized whole. The word pieta meant both pity and piety at the time. So it's a kind of pity, deep compassion that's meant to arouse religious feeling. And so this is an artwork that is supposed to inspire its viewer, viewer to engage emotionally through psychological involvement. In terms of idealization, notice that the Virgin Mary is youthfully beautiful, realistically too young to have a 33-year-old son who she's holding. But this is all purposeful. The idealization is part of the sense of grand emotion and momentous feeling. So the body of Jesus is a kind of youthful, graceful, athletic body. He is on her lap as if he were in a position that recalls him being on her lap as a baby. There's a subtle interplay between life and death, between the promise of renewal and the loss. So he's slipping out of her grasp as if dropping into gravity. And yet there is a leg that's slightly lifted as if there's still life force Re reviving as if hinting at the resurrection to come. He is in her lap slumping with his head thrown back in death. And yet he also is like her baby. Her breast has been carefully carved with the nipple defined as if evoking how she breastfed him. And as if we have this sense of life and death coursing back and forth between them to make this both very beautiful and very moving. 